the norm penthes. That goes up to, I think the data there goes up to 2008. Uh, so later this year we will have a book coming out called the Phnom Penh Water Story that will bring it up to date. But you will see in this paper which you have the progress they have made since 1993. And Phnom Penh is an interesting case for many reasons. Uh, it's the only city I know anywhere in the world whose population declined very, very significantly. Very significant. More than uh, from about 600,000 in the late 60s, early 70s it went down to 125,000 people. And that was not because of choice. Uh, what I want to give you a little background. Some Marxist group took over Phnom Penh, Khmer Rouge. And they did not believe that uh, they want to have an equal egalitarian and agricultural society. So they did not believe in education. In fact, if you are educated, then chances are they picked you up, put you in jail, and you never return from the jail. You are tortured, you basically, you basically, you and your family got killed. So, so it's an interesting case in the sense that within a few years, the whole city, people from the whole city were dispersed to the agricultural area to work as agricultural laborers. And you had to produce your own food in the rural area, which you ate. If you did not have enough food, that's your problem. Okay? So that was the time all of Cambodia was going through a remarkable Marxist revolution. And all the educated people who have, you have to hide that you are educated. You couldn't talk as if you are educated. You have to talk as if you are a farmer. Because once they realized you are educated, you are picked up for special attention. Okay. Now, that Khmer Rouge government continued till about late 90s, up to early 1980s, when it was overthrown by the Vietnamese troops. And I just want to give you some picture of 1993 what was the situation with the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. In 1993, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority had, for the whole authority, that five engineers, five engineers. They had no records, no data, because one of the things Khmer Rouge decided that what is the need for data, okay? For 12 or 15 years, no engineer, no technician could run the water supply of Phnom Penh. Because if you're an engineer, you're picked up as an enemy of the state. If you're a technician, so it was run by people with no knowledge. All the information they had, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority had, they were burnt, destroyed. Because it, it was a very strange situations. So in 1993, as I said, there are five engineers. Most of the technicians they had could not read, or most of the people they had could not read. They could not even read the meters, okay? So you can understand the situation. Nobody believed in working. Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority in 1993, if a average employee worked two hours a day, that was too much. So that fellow was overworking because he or she was working. Corruption was rampant. And what used to happen is if you were coming to the um, Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, there are a whole bunch of authority staff near the gate. 
and as you enter they will catch you and they say what is your problem. So, they find out your problem and they say okay, I will solve your problem, but we have to have an understanding. Understanding means I will solve your problem, you give the money to me. I will go to your house, I will solve the problem to the extent possible, but that is how also they were trying to make some extra money. Salaries were very low, corruption was rampant, so no one was allowed. The moment you entered the gates of the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, the three or four or five of the workers confront you, try to make a deal with you. So, that was the situation in 1993. Uh, most of the city was not getting much water. The unaccounted for water, as I said in the morning, was about 80 percent. Okay. Even in the rich areas, uh, and what they did was, since there was no water anywhere, any time the water came, they tried to catch, get whatever water they could get. Even the rich or the poor, it was a mess. And that was the time, that was the low point in Phnom Penh Water Supplies Authority. Now, what happened, we still do not know. The Prime Minister of Cambodia at that time, picked up a man called Exxon Chan. What is his qualification to run the uh, <coughs> water supply? Nobody knows. Nobody knows why the Prime Minister picked him. Okay. Uh, I still have not figured out. Exxon Chan could not tell me. In Phnom Penh by that time, he had to be a part of the party to have any, any important positions. He was a part of the party. His background was a veterinary surgeon. Okay. Veterinary surgeon, he was put in charge saying, you solve the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority's problem, which was in a complete mess. He knew nothing about water, except he knew, he told me with a green, all he knew was how to drink water, nothing else. And he told me, once he arrived in the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority, he, he was made the director general, is the fancy title, no, they call it in French general director. Fancy title, but he says that was about all. He said when he arrived, he found he does not have even a desk. Okay. His desk was, I, he showed me a photograph, the three legs of the desk, and the fourth one has five bricks holding the fourth part. That was the general director, the boss of Phnom Penh Water <coughs> Supply Authority, working there. Uh, under a tree with his famous desk. So, that was the situation when he took over. So, for one year, he tried to find out what to do to give water. The man was scrupulously honest, straightforward. He said, what can I do? I have been put in charge of water supply. What can I do to improve the water supply conditions of the city? So, he read whatever he could, he traveled qu quite a bit, he consulted with whoever he could, he could and then he came to a few conclusions. First, he decided that if the unaccounted for his water loss is 80 percent, that has to, he has to reduce it. Otherwise, no matter how much water he puts in the system, it is lost. So, they have to, he has to reduce the loss. Second, he wanted to know who are the people, how many people are getting water, if any. Third, he wanted to know how can he expand the water supply. Fourth, he wanted to know, he wanted to have a water pricing and wanted every meter, every house, every apartment to be metered, even the, even the small houses, everything he wanted metered. So, he had no expertise, so in order to meter the houses, he asked the help of the French, asked because Phnom Penh was under the French, uh, French colonial empire, part of the French colonial empire, asked the French to do a house to house survey to see which house is getting water. And 
started developing a rudimentary information system. And then he said, if I'm going to price the water, first I know I need to know who is taking the water, how much water, and who are the major user of water. He said, first I have to catch the big user of water and get them to pay for the water, water they're using, the major user. And he found out two users used about 40 percent of city's water, two users. Can you guess who they are? Hmm? Hmm? Domestic and industry? There was no industry, so <laughs> there was no industry at all. So forget industry in 1993. The two users were, number one user was the army, the biggest user by far. The army had a big presence in Phnom Penh. Number two users was the government. The ministers, the civil servants, the schools, the hospitals, <laughs> the offices, the number two user. They were using 40 percent of the water. Hmm? No. There was some agriculture, but not very much, not very much, but within the city, within the city limit, oh, within, the city. within the city limit, not outside. Uh, I mean, they probably had kitchen gardens and things like this, but uh, not very much. And they basically probably took water from their own well and did the agricultural activity. So his thesis was, if I have to have a good water supply system, First, I have to get the army and the government to pay because they are the biggest consumer, two biggest consumer. And if they don't pay, even all the other pays, there won't be enough money. And when PPWSA was made an autonomous organization for financial reason, that means Phnom Penh municipality was not giving any money to PPWSA. He said, you raise your own money. You are responsible for water supply you handle the water supply. So that, so the, then the question came, how do you get the army and the government to pay? So he, he sent letters to both the government offices and army of offices, cantonment and the army saying, you have, throughout history you have never paid a single real, that is the country's money, real. You have not paid a single real for water. We can't provide you with water for free. From now on, you have to pay for whatever water you're using. And we'll send you a monthly bill saying, this is what you have consumed. You have to pay. So that the, he started the system. Then what happened is, Two months passed, three months passed, neither the army nor the government paid a single cent. So he wrote a letter to all the government departments and the, the army general in charge of the cantonment and saying, if you don't pay, I'm going to cut off your water. Okay? So no, no pay, no water. He could do that under law, that was not a problem. Army, government, couldn't care less. Probably they threw all these letters to the waste paper basket. He sent the second reminder and the third reminder saying, you are not paying, I'm going to cut off your water. Nothing happened. So he sent one of his senior staff to, to the army cantonment and saying, you go and cut off, shut off the water. And when he went to the cantonment and trying to shut off the water, there was a commotion. And the general in charge of the cantonment heard all this commotion. He came out and asked what the hell he was doing. And when he said he was going to cut off the water, his answer was he must be joking. And this general took out his revolver, put it on his head. He said, you are free to cut off the water, but if you s cut off the water, you are a dead man, and after that, I will, I'll switch on the water again. Okay? Well, the only thing will happen is you are dead. Nothing else is going to happen. I I'm going to switch it on. 
and this is real story. I'm saying how things changed in Phnom Penh. So this fellow went very afraid with tears in his eyes to Exxon Chan and saying, Sir, I have three children and a wife. I'm only the breadwinner. If I'm dead, what will happen to this? And besides, the general will shoot me, nothing will happen. And remember Cambodia, it's not like India. If the general shoots you, you are dead. <laughs> you are dead, but nothing happens to the general. I mean, they can get away with anything. It's not like here that a general comes and shoots, he shoots Ashok, then he's in trouble because he will have a whole bunch of cases and police inquiry and he will be in jail. So, Exxon Chan then decided, try to think a strategy. He said, if I can't shut the army off, if I can't the, get the biggest water consumer to pay for it, the small, small consumers will pay, but nothing very much will happen. So he said, for two or three months, he thought about it, what to do. He said, he realized he can't send his stuff. He can't send his stuff to say, you shoot it off, you go there and get shot. He said, he has to do it. And he told me, for two to three months, he prayed to Lord Buddha, saying to give him wisdom. And then, he's a smart man. He prayed to Buddha, all right, but he wanted to have a plan B, because he didn't <laughs> want Lord Buddha's, <laughs> Buddha's uh, help. So he's, he's, one day, he decided he's going to go and going to shut off the water by himself. But his plan B was, he told his wife that uh, children, bid them goodbye. He said, I may come back, I may not come back but I have to do this. So he went, but before he went, he was a smart fellow. His plan B was, he contacted all the newspapers of Phnom Penh and the international correspondent in Phnom Penh. They said, this is what I'm going to do. Chances are the general will shoot me, but you have a good story, okay? So you can see the general shooting me and I'm dying, or something Lord Buddha might do, something good may happen, but you, whatever happens, you have a good story. So he went to close the tap, close, cut off the system, water system, and general soon found out with all the newspaper reporters and the pictures, uh, the photographers ready, so he came with a posse. General came, he was very belligerent. He said, you shoot, and like the pistol put his head and said, I shoot you. And what happened then was very interesting. Maybe Lord Buddha was listening. When he put the gun to his head, all the photographers started taking pictures. The New York Times to local time, all started taking pictures. And the general had second thought. He thought, maybe with all these pictures, he may not be able to get away. So he put his revolver in, the, in his pocket, went back, and then instructed his staff to pay the, all the outstanding water bill. So next day, it was all in the newspaper, okay, that uh, this is what happened, and the water bill was paid. And what happened is Hun Sen, the prime minister, came out, he said, what Mr. Exxon Chan did was the right thing to do. Whether he paid his water bill or not, I don't know. But he said, I pay my water bill. All my ministers must pay my water bill, all their water bill. And the government must pay all its water bill. And from then on, there's a new day for the Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority. News got around, there is a man in charge, who does not take no for an answer. He wants what is good. So from there on, the army has been paying its bill, the government has been paying its bill, and people, surprisingly, people never had any, once everything had, no one ever complained paying the water bill. 
So everyone in Phnom Penh, whoever gets water pays the bill. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. And if your water bill is less than 1% of your household income, you get a very subsidized rate. And in fact, what he did was very simple. He decided that if your water consumption is less than 10 meter cube per, per month, you are poor. Poor or medium poor, okay? So if your consumption was less than 10 meter cube, he didn't want to go into a long, decide how many, how many people are in your household, what is your income. It was a big, big hassle. And he did not have the time, energy, or the manpower to do that. He said, we need a simple process. 10 meter cube, you are poor. More than 10 meter cube, you have to pay. So 10 meter cube and below, you get a very subsidized price. The moment you go to 10.1 meter, you don't get any subsidy. You pay 10 meter full, full price and then no subsidies at all. If you can afford it, no subsidy. Only poor get a very targeted subsidy. <coughs> so So he sorted out the business part of it. The biggest problem was his staff. His staff was extremely corrupt. He had a deputy who was very politically well connected and probably corrupter in chief, okay? <laughs> he took as much money as possible. He threatened him, he told him, either you stop taking money, do your job, if not, you are fired, I'll fire you. <coughs> this fellow thought, he so well connected, he can do whatever he wanted. In fact, all other government departments, well connected could do whatever they wanted, make money, I mean, buy, Whatever they could do means collect money left, right, and center, any way possible. So he got fed up, Exxon Chan got fed up and told him that from tomorrow you are fired. Told the gatekeeper, the security guard, from tomorrow this man is not coming to PPWSA. And he's going to clear all his belongings today, and he's out. So he said, I'm going to my brother, who is a minister, and I'll take you to court, a lot of threaten. He said, do whatever you want. I couldn't care less. So he got rid of him. All the senior people, he fired them, because they're either incompetent, mostly, as you are saying, literate. What did you say in the morning? Uh, educated, <laughs> illiterate or whatever it is. Okay, they the same thing. Uh, of all the people were maybe educated but very corrupt. So he got rid of all the senior staff, all the senior staff. He tried to get them to follow the new rules but they were not interested. He got rid of them, brought in a whole bunch of new people, sent them mostly for some reason to Australia for training, education. Uh, just the basic training. I, you don't make a somebody who doesn't very much about water supply an expert in one year. So he sent them for basic tra education training. And then he, he, he started his work. What happened is he would then went to the Japanese saying that he wants some help with the construction of waterworks. Basically, Khmer Rouge had basically destroyed the system. And he told the Japanese, look, I need you to prepare a plan. I can't do it because we don't have the people. I need, we need a plan ready. We need the money to execute this plan. And we need a plan so that anyone else who wants to help Cambodia or Phnom Penh they can work within the plan. 
So the plan will give the blueprint. If you as a British want to help, you have to work within the plan. Uh, if ADB wants to help, gives loan, you have to take part of the plan and implement that plan. So everybody must work according to the plan. So JICA came out with a plan for Phnom Penh, which for the next, that was 1993, for the next 20 years was the blueprint for its development. Okay. By 1998, he had brought down the unaccounted for losses from 80% to about 30%. Most of the majority of the people in Phnom Penh started getting water because losses was reduced, new intake was developed, new water treatment was done. So reduction of losses, new water coming in, slowly most of the Phnom Penh started getting water 24 hours a day. Now, I was, I was mentioning it today. When I was first told about the Phnom Penh, my first reaction was impossible. How is it possible? A city with no, not much expertise, extremely corrupt, uh, a country very corrupt, uh, not enough management. <laughs> How could they have a good water supply system when a country like India, Indonesia, or Malaysia with much expertise, more money, more administrative staff, more technical staff, a private sector, there's no private sector. Uh, you mentioned industry, and there's no, nothing at all. How can they do it? It didn't make any sense. What was the source, source of water? Source was Mekong. So the advantage of the Phnom Penh is, is on the river of Mekong. So there are plenty of water, so but water, the uh, source is not a problem. Source has never been a problem. Problem was how to get the water, how to treat it, how to have the system distribution. So they are having the technical people to handle this job. They didn't have, as I said, when he took over, there were five engineers. Oh. So they had no. Well, what was the capacity? You have the details there. I don't. Okay. You don't remember. I don't remember what was the capacity. Okay. How much was there? Take a look there. All the detailed figures are there. So what he basically started doing is to making sure that everyone has water. And no, I was just saying that when I heard Phnom Penh was the case, I'm a very skeptical scientist. I said this is impossible. Uh, other countries have not done it. It looks like. It's a PR exercise by the Asian Development Bank because they have loaned the money. They want to say that the project is an outstanding success, outstanding success, okay? Which generally is the case. If USAID gives you the money, that project is wonderful, the best in the world. Well, so after taking over the start, huh? they completely done the rehabilitation and... Slowly, slowly. It took some time. You have to go to the Japanese for money. You have to go to the ADB for Come Not rehabilitation, you have to completely change it. Okay, so almost how much time we are taking? Five to ten years? By 19, 1998, in five years' time, he started showing results. Uh, it took a longer time. But, but after five years? You could, people could see, see the difference. So he pr first he provided water to the central district. Then he slowly as more water was available, that was expanded. And now s slowly and slowly, what is happening now, no other city in Cambodia can provide water to its people on a 24 by 7 clean water. So as he succeeded, the government decided the jurisdiction of the PPWSA, its water supply authority, is steadily increased. So now what, is ha ha what has been happening last 20 years is once they reach certain, first they handle the city, then all the villages and the peri-urban area, they came under water supply authority, PPWSA. The government said, you will have to supply them. So last 20 years, the area they're supplying has been steadily increasing, steadily increasing. So now it includes all the villages around for a very large, very large area. 
the interesting thing is no one really complained to pay better when they saw the service they were getting the quality of water they are getting no one complained about paying the money and the especially the poor even the shanty towns they, he did not go for a tube well initially he was worried they will steal water but he decided that every small house small hut they are basically shanty town means you have one room basically where you live and that room is yours whether unlike in india whether you have a legal authority or not he could not care less he provided direct water connection to your one room direct 24 by 7 connection when i first went to sicily and i went to examine ppwsa and i met with him and all his senior staff in the meeting i was rather impressed by him i didn't mean i didn't know him before the first thing he said sir whatever information whatever knowledge you want it is yours i'll give it to you everything we have but i have one request and that request is don't tell us what we are doing right tell us what we are not doing right and how we can improve it i have never been to a client or to do a study where says don't tell us what good things we are doing i want to know things that are not working well that really impressed me that here is a man who wants to now so in that meeting i told him i want the following information so i gave him a lot of data as bank you are saying we need data ashok was saying data driven if you do want to deny analysis we need data so i told him i need a whole bunch of data how much water you using how much water you are producing what is your unaccounted for how has it gone up or down during the year what is your pricing structure how many people are paying everything i wanted i gave them a list of things just 1 2 3 4 5 he looked at me is that all you'll have it tomorrow morning and when i went back in the hotel i said i told cecilia chances of getting tomorrow morning is zero so i'll be very interested to see what he what he says because i didn't know him at that time because if i go to delhi and tell i want what is your unaccounted for water how many consumers do you have how many how home self meters what is your bill collection efficiency <coughs> how much money did you get last month okay information is not available even though the the former chief executive became one of my proteges wonderful man he doesn't have that information so for a nonpen to tell me that they will give me tomorrow my expectations were zero that i won't get very much next day i arrived all the computer printouts were there everything i wanted that not only that they did the trend analysis from 1993 to 2008 showing me how things have improved they gave me raw data so i can check the trend analysis everything i wanted they gave it to me and i was really very very surprised that how good a information system they have done if you want to know how much money nompen water supply authority made yesterday yesterday forget today yesterday last 24 hours what was their income you go to the head of the administration he goes a few clack 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 he says this is my this is our income yesterday okay if you ask them what are your plans financial plans for the next 10 years already 
So we are going to do this, we are going to do this, this is a good improvement, we are going to improve this, we are going to these pipelines, all done serially. And I said, this is a really a very interesting organization <coughs> compared to anything I have seen in any other developing country before. As I mentioned bef yesterday or the, the day before, Phnom Penh can tell me how much money they got it tomorrow, yesterday, okay? But Delhi's last analysis, financial analysis, was seven years ago, okay? So last time, the latest data they have on their income, loss, everything, is seven years ago. You cannot run, in fact, if you have a corner grocery store, if your income, loss income is seven years back, you'll go bankrupt within a month, within a month, okay? But that is because the Delhi municipality subsidizes Delhi job board, nobody cares, so they can survive. So the information system they have done is absolutely remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And the other interesting thing is, there's no private sector in Cambodia. So they cannot outsource anything. Con laying of pipes. If they give it to the private sector, it cost two and two and a half times to what they can do in in-house and the quality <coughs> is very bad. So they have to do everything. So they became chief cook and bottle washer. They buy the pipes, they lay the pipes, they do the maintain the pipes. Nothing can be outsourced to the private sector because the private sector doesn't exist. So PPWSA is become a completely functional organization doing everything in house. And the reason, one reason I was also impressed is the first time I went to see him, he went to, he went to show me his water treatment work where the water comes from the Mekong and they treat the water. Absolutely clean. The treatment plant is absolutely clean. And we were walking around and one place, there was one small pebble. And I saw X and Chan pick up, bent down, pick up the pebble and put it in his pocket, okay? So he had that much detail, he was looking that there's no place for a pebble in a water treatment plant on the top, so he put it in his pocket. So, and the other very interesting thing he did is, he told his staff that if you discuss anything with the politicians, you are fired. You are fired. If a politician call, it, call you, you tell them, sir, if I talk with you, I'm fired. So I can't talk with you, but here is the number of Mr. X and Chan. He would be delighted to speak with you. So he shielded his staff completely from the political process. No politician can pick up. The, my nephew used to work for Calcutta Municipal Corporation. He was supposed to be the head of planning. He said, all, forget planning. All you'd get from morning to evening, some politicians from Calcutta will phone him, say, I am not getting any water, do something. He says, nothing could be planned, all ad hoc, just putting out fires by so-called VIPs or important people. But Exxon Chan made a rule that, no, the staff's job is to work. And a few things he did is, is quite remarkable. Everyone in PPWSA, including Exxon Chan, wears the same uniform, same uniform, PPWSA. There's a canteen where everyone goes to eat, including him. Normally, the bosses never eat with the workers, and the workers mean all types of workers, the laborers, everything. If whoever works in PPWSA, they get a subsidized, decent meal in the canteen. All his senior staff, he himself, invariably eats in the canteen. And that is the time, if you have any complaints, anything you see, 
you go sit with him or his staff and tell him a free for all and that is how he finds out what's going on okay so the, the system he put around, put himself around is really remarkable that way he knew what not only what was going on and the other thing he said he told me in 1995, two years after he took over, the auditors of the government, every, every, all gov it was a public sector autonomous organization, but that is audited by the government. So auditors came to audit his book. And they told him, if you give us some money, we'll make, we'll make sure that we'll say everything is OK. And only some minor, minor things have to be done here and there. And he said that, no, 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 no. Not only I want to give you any money, but I want you to tell everything you find wrong with the system. I want to know everything that you find wrong with the system so that I can correct it. And this crooked auditor said, this is too much work. You won't get many, any money out of it. So, Let's finish this audit as quickly as possible. Let's go somewhere else where we can make some money. Okay, so that basically they gave him a reasonably clean bill of health. They got no money, and that was the first time the auditors went empty-handed without getting any money. So it is not that, that we can't beat the system. We have to play with the system, and we need find we need to find a man like Exxon Chan to change the habit. Uh, they made it an autonomous corporation. <coughs> the salaries of the staff are not like the government's, not the government salary. And one reason why there is so much corruption in Cambodia, salaries are extremely low. If you want to survive and raise a family, there's no way you can survive in the salary they give. And so they try to make money in any way they're possible. So that. I, PPWSA salaries are decided by its board. And they are at least four to five times the salary of a government civil servant in an equivalent position. Okay. Uh, and that makes it quite a bit of difference because I'm quite sure there is some corruption, but very little that is visible. I mean, every corruption is everywhere. I mean, I have not met a country that is that you can call corruption free. I have not met a single country that's corruption free. It depends also what you mean by corruption. Uh, I had a Indian friend who was big contractor in Kolkata. He went to US, started a contracting business. So I asked him, with the Indian system and the US system, which one would you like? Because I was quite convinced he would say, being a contractor in India is tough. Being a contractor in US will be simple. He said, give me India anytime, anytime. I was very puzzled. I said, why? He said, he said it's very simple. In India, I know if I have to get a contract, I have to give you 20%, okay? I know that. I give you 20%, <coughs> pro quo, I get the contract. 99.99% .99 sure, I get the contract. Hmm? I, can, I, think I can get to the work. In US, he said he has to hire lobbyists to get a contract. So he gives the lobbyist money, very similar amount of money, but he does not know whether he'll get the contract. He has no idea what the lobbyist does with the money. He said, all it depends how you define corruption. So he has to give money to the lobbies to get the contract, but there's no guarantee you'll get the contract. In India, at least, he gives the money, he gets the contract. He's, and his thesis was very simple. You take the Indian system anytime, then the American system where he spends a lot of money, but most of the time he doesn't get the contract. But that is way, just an anecdote, your way, of, way you can see the corruption in a different way. So the good thing about PPWSA is 
it is now providing water 24 by 7. It's every house is now metered. When you look at the bill collection efficiency, the amount of money they collect from the bills every every month. When I saw the figure, I couldn't understand it because he said their bill collection efficiency is 102 percent. And my my question was, you, if everybody pays your bill, it becomes 100 percent. Okay, how is it possible you get a 102 percent efficiency? He said, no, very simple. In order to increase or improve our cash flow, what we do is, if we, you, have a, you live in Phnom Penh, you have a connection. So I give you an option to pay in advance next month's bill. Okay. So if you pay in advance next month's bill, I give you a 5% discount. Okay. So if you pay in advance, you get a 5% discount. It helps our cash flow. And that's why the bill collection efficiency is 102 to 103 percent. Okay, so many little things he has done. Now, <coughs> I did a study in the Colombo Water Supply Authority for the Japanese. Japanese gave them a few hundred million dollars to do a Colombo Water Supply, and they asked me and Cecilia to review Colombo Water Supply Authority. The biggest source of corruption in Colombo Water Supply Authority, we found out, are the meter reader. Meter reader. What happens is the meter readers are given an area. So you are in responsible for, let's say, an area with uh, few roads. You are responsible <coughs> for looking at the meter. And you are responsible to write down what the meter in these areas are. And everybody knows in Colombo what happens. The meter reader then comes to the households or the industry, said, okay, let's have a little uh, private discussion, okay? I will give you consistently lower reading uh, so that you don't pay much, but I must also get something in return, okay? So let's have a understanding. I will reduce your bill by 40%, but I get 20% of your benefit you are getting. So you win, I win. Who loses? Government. Go government. Government loses their income. So we found it out and we said to the minister, that to the simple thing is what is happening is once you become a meter reader, you are given an area, you start your career in that area, and you retire looking after that area. So that means over 20, 30, 40 years, you have a very nice arrangement with everybody. Every month you are collecting money. So you have a very good lifestyle. He, then he may be a meter reader, but uh, he has an excellent lifestyle. So I told the Director General of Colombo Water Supply, our advice to them was very simple. Let's rotate the meter reader. Okay, so you are responsible for these three states, only for this month. Okay, next month he will be responsible for the three states. So all the arrangements you have done with all these people over the past, he doesn't know them, and he is not going to stay more than one month. Month later, he will go and read the meter. Very simple. We use the same number of people, but we rotate them every month. We rotate them so that they cannot come with an understanding. You know what happened? The meter supplies union is very strong. They went to the minister. They said, if you do that, we are all going on strike and there's going, nothing going to be there. And the minister called the director general and said, lay off, lay off. So it's not that we don't know what is happening. It's not that we don't know how it can be solved. But what PPWSA did, to do exactly that, they not only rotate the meter readers, one very interesting they did is, supposing you are a meter reader and you are also a meter reader and you find out that somebody in his area that is responsible has an unauthorized connection. 
or he is doing some hanky panky. Hmm? Then, if you inform that to PPWSA, you get a bonus because you said this non-authorized exist, non-authorized non connection exists in his area, okay, which he had not seen. So you get a bonus for finding that out, a significant bonus, and he gets a punishment that he had not found it out, you found it out. Okay? So small things like this he did which has made enormous difference to the, to the authority. PPWSA now as I said at the beginning does not get a single cent from the municipality, not a single cent. <coughs> it will be unheard of to say that whichever municipality you come from that water supply do not get a single cent from that municipality, not nothing at all. Only thing that they have is the land they had before, so that the government gave them free, but everything else they have to pay for it, everything else. Since it is a public autonomous corporation and it has been making profit consistently from about 1998. In addition, in not only they do not get any money, <coughs> since they are making a profit, they have to pay the government taxes. So it is one of those few profitable public sector institutions in, in Cambodia which pays taxes to the government. So instead of taking money from the government, they are actually <coughs> giving the money to the government as taxes and all paid by domestic industrial consumer richer poor. So the lesson of Phnom Penh Water Supply Authority is very simple. I have tried to sell this idea to Kejriwal. I told him make Del Delhi Public Supply, Delhi Jal Board a fully autonomous corporation, fully autonomous corporation. give them the authority to decide on prices. Put in a regulator, independent regulator who only regulator and his staff will decide what Delhi Jal Board can charge. So they look at how much, what should be the water price, what should be the coverage, what should be the water per capita water availability or they give some performance indicators. Then get somebody as the head of the Delhi Jal Board, not by political favor or by IS officers, by headhunt that person. Get a CEO of Delhi Jal Board saying that you are going to be the head of the Delhi Jal Board and you have a six year term, but we will be evaluating you each year. This year, let us say you are unaccounted for water is 40 percent. Next year it must be 34 percent or 35 percent. He said give them some benchmark so that you have to show continuous improvement so that the fellow shows you just can't come six years free run and they say we, we could not do very, very much. No, no, no. Each year you look the person performance and get a person who will do that for six years and then after six years if he or she performs well, if you want to increase by another two, three years, that is okay. But again, give him some benchmarks that those are the performance indicators they will have to match. Th those are unacceptable to any Indian politician. So that is one of the problem. It is not that we cannot solve Delhi's water problem or Kharagpur's water problem. It is a mindset problem. First, we have to get our politicians to accept that water is not free. It has to be priced at a reasonable rate so that for sure it should not exceed one and a half percent of the household's income, but most people, probably 80 percent of the people in the towns or 70 percent will have to pay the full cost of water. The poor people <coughs> give them a direct subsidy only to the poor. But this water pricing is the I have discussed with many utilities, 
They said, other than this, please do the suggestion. This is not possible. That is the problem. Uh, and, but you are absolutely right, Ashok. Politicians in India think if you give cheap water, you get more votes. But few places we got the success. I have convinced in the new town uh -huh. because we did the IIT was doing the happiness study, and everybody is relatively very rich. And if you provide good quality water, even they don't mind. Even paying thousand rupees is very easy. In yeah. fact, that you know, if th this is a fallacy of the politician. They think that people don't want for good service. People don't want to pay if you provide a lousy service, lousy water service, and I charge them more. So this is what is happening. Sir, major, huh? five major, you have seen the Indian utility. Mm -hmm. If five major huh? uh, success parameters, uh -huh. which is like doable in Indian condition, mm -hmm. what you have, you know, which we can. Start and we can advise technical and non-technical. Several par parameters. I mean, there is no one single performance indicator for a water utility. Uh, one of you asked, "How do I know Singapore is one of the best?" I think you asked uh, this. I don't know if Singapore is one of the best, but you look at that performance indicator. Per capita water consumption last six years has come down from 178 liters per capita per, per person per day to now 143 and falling. If you look at their income over expenditure, they are okay. Water supply, wastewater, they are managing it without any subsidy, including 2% of infrastructure each year is replaced, modernized. Say, for example, pipes, water supply, storage pipes, two uh, storage uh, pipes. 2% of the length is completely changed every year. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, it's not even preventive maintenance. This one is old, it's still working. We change it. Before, before any accident happens. So 2% change happens every year. To, as a mat matter of routine, they have a very good preventive maintenance also, but 2% is automatically changed every year. So they don't wait for the whole system to break down before they start modernizing. No, no, no. Uh, they start, they have some criteria by which to do that. So the first, you have to make sure they have enough money, they have income, is at least this covers their expenditure. Because Singapore government does not subsidize anything, including medical services. Okay? Uh, this is why it is, Singapore has one of the best medical services in the world, but they spend only 6% of GDP compared with US. And I think US spend 15 to 16% of GDP. And if I want to see a specialist, I can see a specialist if it is important, immediately. If not, within the same week. No problem at all. Okay. And you must pay for it. If you are really poor, the government pays for it. But then you have to show you are poor and you are justified uh, to get a subsidy. And the same thing with the Singapore's water supply. Everybody must pay. But the poor gets a subsidy. And that poor will be depending <coughs> your income, what is your household income, how many people are in the family, because if you have a very large family, so they have a whole variety of criteria. But the most interesting thing is you get a subsidy, but the subsidy is not paid by the water utility. There is a Department of Social Security. That Department of Social Security gives you a voucher, depending on your economic conditions. Say, if you are poor, then every two months, every two months we get a bill. The Social Security will give you a voucher. Okay? That voucher, you have the freedom to use it for water or water or electricity. 
You can use 20% for water, 80% for electricity. You can use all for water. It doesn't matter. Okay, but the water utility is reimbursed by the Social Security <coughs> Department the full amount. So water water department does not subsidize you because you are poor, because it's not the job of the water. Because thesis of the Singapore Depart Singapore government is if you are poor, you not only need water, electricity, you need transportation, you need education, you need health services, whole bunch of things. Okay, but that must be very targeted. So, water authority PUB, the water authority, does not subsidize you. It's the state to the social security <coughs> subsidizes that, and PUB gets the full money. So you as a Poor person, if you are, if you happen to be poor, you know how much subsidy you are allowed, and that also helps you to manage your. You, you, you don't get a free free meal, and PUB does not lose any money because of subsidizing. So this uh, Singapore, relatively the people must be very healthy compared to our country because. Everything is food is not contaminated or not the irritated. You know, water is good. So these are the you know why, how oftenly we sick because of everything is contaminated. Uh, in so the I, I do not know other point of view. No, 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 and all. no, no. That that one of the big problem in Singapore is like all over the world, uh, people are becoming fatter and fatter. Okay, that that is the same. Yeah, yeah. That that is the that, reason, you know. Uh, six in, years ago, Mexico also. Mexico yeah. is the one of the. And, yeah. uh, I I was in Texas when uh. the people they come and they eat in front of me and feel like you know. <laughs> yes. You know, so they have so the th big roti and they put all the vegetables, everything, yeah. and roll and they will start eating. Yes. <laughs> so. So that that that's a, that is also in the Singapore we see obesity is in the increase. The worst thing is, important thing is the child obesity. The, even the children. Uh, in my time, when I was a kid, we went from the school, finish our school, then we went and played football or cricket until it was night. These days, nobody plays any football. What does the kid do? Take this damn phone and they start playing their computer games or chat in the Facebook or whatever it is. That's how they do that. So but there's the exercise is yeah. much less. As sir said, if you have good food, good water, and not contaminated air, and doing minimum exercise, you need not require to go to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so vaccines from the. No, this is minimum, you know, and oxygen is playing the role. This is not like courses for water. <laughs> so, so. So th those are, are some, hmm? you are saying something? No, I wanted to ask um, the switching topic. Um, so what has been the privatization story in terms of like water utilities? I know U.S., um, there have been some attempts to like you know, mm -hmm. privatize water supplies and then, or at least have private management of water, yes. water utilities. Sing yes, no, it's a very good question. Singapore has, <laughs> has a very, interesting rule, which I have not seen any other country. Any government department who cannot do as well as the private sector in any specific area, that specific area has to be outsourced if the government spends more money in that than the private sector. All, each ministry has within it a group whose job is to benchmark your ministry's own performance in the individual area. So for example, if leak detection can be done private sector cheaper than the PUB, that has to be outsourced to the private sector. If the billing can be done by somebody cheaper than what you can do, that has to be outsourced by the private sector, outsourced to the private sector. But overall, public sector is in charge. They would not think, dream of at least the present government and the, at least for the next several, at least next decade, Venki, they would not dream of giving the responsibility to the private sector. And they are also worried many things. I'll tell you, you raised a very important question. They're all, they had thought at one stage when this wave of private sector came up, you know, there's all over the world, there's a wave of private sector in interest. One of the things they became very worried about 
supposing they give a concession for 10, 20, 30 years. What will be the at the end of the sec 20th year when the concession ends, what will be the quality of the infrastructure and they can run it to the ground, make the maximum amount of money and when they take over, the government takes over or any other company takes over and spend, have to spend an enormous amount of money to update it and they could not find any solution and they said we are running a quite efficient solution anyway we are outsourcing anything that we can't do better. So, we will continue to be in charge. Specific activities can be outsourced, but under our control and management. So, that is that is the right or wrong, I am not saying the pluses and minuses, anything we do has pluses and minuses, but that is their view. They do not want to outsource anything to the private sector. They want to keep complete control. I have no problem with that because they are running a very efficient, reasonably efficient show. So that, that, that's been the model for mm -hmm. most facilities in the US. Mm -hmm. Like billing these days is completely outsourced. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper to bill mm -hmm. somebody else, you know, uh, especially if you have automatic metering yes. and stuff. So this everything is running by private metering? No, the billing part, so there will be automatic meters, like, you know, so they wirelessly send it sends how much water was used. No, that and is then it makes a bill and then it generates yeah. the mail it. Yeah. So, collection part is? Collection part usually is outsourced to another company. So, there are companies that work with several utilities yeah. that do so, it for yeah. each utility. So, that part is not a problem, right. but they want to, the the they want, they want to keep in, ch in charge. They, they want to know and they want to make sure there is a 50 year plan and they want to make sure the plan is being executed and they do not trust the private sector to think of the future when the contract is going to be over. So, those are some of the considerations. Some of the, hmm. the government also hmm. I have been even the government of West Bengal, some of the plants hmm. is, is even better than the similar plants running by private. Some of the employees you know they are so dedicated. Hmm. In some of the plant in Bengal, uh -huh. I do not know, time is not there, it's far away. Uh -huh. it's like Barakpur plant, some of you have visited. It's the almost 10 years is over and beautiful plant. Yes. In 10 years also, they are running. Now they are going to, losses are 11 percent within the plant now because ADB want to declare that plant as the ideal plant. They want to bring down the, uh, the plant losses also less than 5 percent. In beautiful plant, they have Iskada, they have everything, and outside is so you, know, you will not find even a you know piece of paper outside yeah. running by totally government. Business. Yes, no, this, this, this that you are absolutely right. If you look, the world's most efficient water utility, most efficient water utility, they are not in the private sector. They are in the public sector. Most efficient. For example, Singapore, Tokyo, they are all public sector, all run by public sector very well. But it is also a fact some of the most inefficient water <laughs> utilities are all in the public I, I, sector. I agree with you. And then we have examples, we have done a lot of studies on what happens but given the private sector. We have examples of a utility being privatized and the private sector took over and the performance deteriorated from what it was before the public sector. We have examples exactly the reverse, exactly the reverse that I will come to you in a minute that you privatized it and the private sector took over in it does and improved its management very, very significantly. In the same country or even the sa same city, Manila privatized its water supply and they divided it in two parts. One part worked remarkably well, other part was a total failure. It is in the same city. If you look at Morocco, city of Casablanca, Marrakesh has been an outstanding success, Tangiers has been outstanding success, but Rabat, the capital was a failure. So, they had to kick out the private sector, get somebody else. So, what I am, the moral of the story is public sector is not inherently bad, private sector is not inherently good. And this is, I, I want to leave one thing 
Deng Xiaoping told me. He said, only thing, only thing he's interested, he doesn't give a damn whether the color of the cat is white, black, or gray. It doesn't matter. Only thing he wants to know, can the cat catch the mice? If the cat can catch the mice, he's quite happy. Same goes with the private sector. Can it deliver? If it can deliver, I don't care whether it's private sector, public sector, I'm for it. I have no problem with private sector. I'm not one of those who starts fuming when we talk about the private sector. Hmm? In fact, when in Nagpur I went and I said, the public sector is not doing well, so let's try the private sector. All the NGOs were up against. He said, he's, he's a lackey of the private sector. He's promoting blah, blah, blah. But I don't care whether it's public sector, private sector. Only thing I want to know is the performance good. Are you providing water at a reasonable price? Is are poor and rich getting it? That's all I want to know. So that should be our motto. You wanted to say something. Oh, they are very strict. For example, let's say you have a company, leak detection company. You are detecting leaks. Hmm? They will check how many leaks you have detected, what is the, your performance. So there will be strict monitoring. As Benki was saying, monitoring is very important. They will continually monitor your performance. They will see how much water is being lost from the system. If you're not doing well, you're out. So just because you have a five-year contract, you could be kicked out in a one month's notice. And there's a continuous monitoring about your performance. Just because it's, it is given to the private sector doesn't mean you have a license for the next few, few years to do whatever you want. So it's strictly monitored. Your performance is strictly monitored. The KPIs are spelled out quite clearly in the contract. And you must follow this KPI. One of the interesting things we learned in Singapore, even as a professor, we have to, we all have our KPIs. In the annual review, everyone goes through an annual review. The university gives me my KPI, very specific KPI, P, KPI, uh, key performance index. And so if I was supposed to do so many papers, so many lectures, uh, so many books, and so many this, they want to see, have I made my KPI? Preferably exceeded my KPIs. Singapore is, there are plus, again, there are some pluses or minuses. It is so KPI oriented that sometimes they don't see the forest because of the trees. So that, that's also a problem. But it is very performance oriented. OK. Any more questions? OK. <coughs> Building works. I mean, if the government are going to take over, uh, there, there actually is some more. For example, six W or two W, as compared to the, if they are giving it of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And what I mean to say, if they are keeping the quality, quality set, and give it to the private sector for the construction, and by fulfilling all measures, whatever they have mentioned in there for the quality. Then it will be better, I think, for uh, Singapore in the utility sector. I'm speaking of we're talking of water utility, not everything else. In water utility, virtually every construction, it's a public tender for uh, for the work to be done. They don't do it, but they keep strict check on your performance. So there's a whole. This is why whole bunch of companies, water companies, water are in Singapore because there are so much government contracts to be available. That also creates employment. Okay? And they are given to the public, a private sector, but control is very strict. Monitoring is very strict. You can't get away 
with not non uh, that is the problem that is also. yes no that that is the that is the that is the problem corruption uh, <coughs> is very strict and uh, all cor corruption all type uh, i think i mentioned to you that as a professor i have to every year say if I received any gifts, if any of, my, any of my family member is working in the university or a student in the university, anything that could be a conflict of interest, every year I have to fill it up, every year. And if I don't do it properly, I, I had it. I also have to say, do I have any connection with any company which does business with the National University of Singapore. Do I have any share, or and if, even though it's in the market and anyone can buy a share, do I? Have any, I have to declare everything with conflict of interest, and that is very strict. Uh, we, we have a one of the NUS professors. He was fired because this professor was pressurizing a female student, okay, harassing. The moment the university found it out, that's it. Whole bunch of hula blue, his name was in the newspapers, and he was fired almost overnight. They don't accept any non-performance, any hanky-panky, any way possible. So that is a strict thing. And good thing is, the legal system is very quick. If you want to fire somebody in India, I have seen, in, in at least in the civil service, it drags on for 10 years. 10 years that fellow, it's actually a very good thing, 10 years for, for the fellow, he stays home, gets the salary, goes, everything goes to the court, he gets an another job and starts working at it, and then by the time the verdict comes, he's already retired and he has got his pension, okay? So th these are the problem, but uh, these are structural problem in the country. I don't know how to break it. Here also most of the work is outsourced to government yes. and to reward. Yes. But the then is the supervision. Government have created lot of uh, Public sector companies like rights and VCC. Yes, uh, yes. I have. Uh, I fully agree with you what you are saying. They have done. I have also some problem like in water sector. The biggest one is Wafkus. Wafkus. Hmm? Okay. It has no in-house expertise. No in-house expertise. So it gets a contract from Wafkus. Wafkus. Water and Power Consultancies Limited. It belongs to the Ministry of Water Resources of the Central Government, of course. You can take a look. It has no expertise. It gives, it outsources everything it gets. Okay? Only one that gives it contract are the government, the state governments, or the central government. And it has turned out that since WAPCOS gives out contracts, there's a lot of leakages in those contracts. So it costs, it costs uh, 60 percent higher than any private sector, 60 percent higher. So this is a public sector company which is supposed to do it. So that is the problem. How do we check all these abuses? Because if you, if you are a West Bengal government, you can give a contract to WAPCOS. You don't need three contracts. You can give it overnight because it's a public sector unit. Those are the rules. Okay. So they're taking advantage of that on the, from the government sector. It's for the easy of its work. But everything is outsourced. At one time, it had a very good group of people. Fifteen years ago, it had a very good group of people. Now it has bec become 
only outsourcer. They get a contract from one government, then they have to subcontract with somebody else and have a huge overhead in between and also a few extra bucks for the staff's pocket. So how do we stop all this? I, 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 I've given up thinking about it because more I think, more, more mad I get. And I don't see it. I don't, I don't see any solution. We Indians are very good at finding loopholes. So what, whatever good things we want to do, people will find out some benefit, extra benefit in doing that. We are extremely good at that. And that, that is one of our strength and one of our biggest weakness. So any questions? Okay. Regarding again. No, please go ahead. Singapore is a very pragmatic country. It does not have any political views. What it does is it develops a policy which thinks it will work. Then it tries to implement that policy. If it works fine, the question is can we improve it further? If it doesn't work for two years' time, they say, sorry, we made an error. It doesn't work. We won't follow that policy. I mentioned one, just one example, the pig farming. Yes. The idea was good at the beginning. They found out water quality is a problem. Immediately, they stopped pig farming, immediately. So they are not wedded to any policies. They are very pragmatic. They try something. If it works, well and good. If it doesn't work, the minister only will go out to the parliament and said, look, for, we got the best advice possible. We did our best, best studies. That was looked to be good, but in reality it does not. So finish. We go to something else. Singapore are very practical people. Okay, they have no left or right ideology. Only thing they want is, if am I richer next year than today? Okay, if the average household is richer next year than or the year after than today, they are quite happy. They don't care whether they're left or right. They want to. Like, uh, that I don't know. Uh, that I, I honestly don't know. But they are very pragmatic. It's also the only country I know, the last election, last election, the leader of the opposition <coughs> in public said, if you elect us, if you elect us, 80% of the things the current government is doing is good for the country. And we will continue doing those 80% because that is good for the country. And the party fully supports what's good for them. Only 20% will differ. And that, those were his ex exact comments. 20% will differ. We'll only change those 20%. But basically, you won't see very much difference because 80% will be the same. Think about BJP and Congress, OK? Can, do you think BJP or Congress will go and say, 80% of the things the previous government did, we agree with it? 20% we disagree, yeah? No one, no one when, when Congress was in power, it wanted to pass goods and services tax. Who opposed it? Opposition. 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 BJP came into power, then they wanted to do goods and services tax. Who opposed it? Congress. Congress. Nobody thinks about the future of the country, what is good for the country. Everyone is thinking about how do we get power? How do we get? 
So, this is what we see in Singapore, people are pragmatic and the way of thinking is very different. Emerging pollutants, we are doing a lot of research, but we still do not know what, what to do with it. You are talking about industrial wastewater? No, no, e emerging pollutants, e emerging contaminants. Contaminants in wastewater? Yes. Spe pharmaceutical pharma and part. We, we pharmaceutical is not coming in the domestic wastewater? Uh, no. Very small concentration because they have industrial wastewater system. No. Uh, but how much can you? Oh, they are quite. The concentration? the concentration is low, it is parts per trillion, but the biggest problem, yes, the biggest problem, the concern with the emerging concern. In emerging that case, well, it can be diluted. <coughs> no, you can not. Reservoir, they are mixing, no. No, no. no, 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 no in Singapore, no, no, they are where they are, you know. No, that is not the con concern. The main concern is even though parts per trillion, what we are seeing next to the wastewater treatment plants. We have seen in the US, we have seen in uh, Europe, we have seen it in Japan. After you treat the waste water, you discharge it to the river. Many of the small species of fish now have developed dual sexes, the same male and female in the same sex because, because of these emerging contaminants, uh, hormone disruption uh, products that uh, that we are discharging. So, the problem is the concentration we are talking of parts per trillion and the problem is how, how do we know small fishes are having problem, but does it mean even the higher mammal, the bigger fishes and even worse, even more difficult the human beings. What we will do if we use very small micro doses on a regular basis every day for the next 30 years, what will we do? So, we are trying even to develop a methodology how to, how to see the impact of parts per trillion. What has happened last 40 years, when I was your age and I was at IIT, we are talking of parts per thousand, okay? Parts per thousand, because technology was not very advanced. Then it went to parts per 100,000. PPM, parts per million, nobody in my time talked of the parts per million because technology is advancing, instrumentation technology is advancing very, very fast. Now we can easily handle parts per trillion. For example, all the wastewater treated in England, all the wastewater treated in England, we can find that significant presence of cocaine. It is well known, significant presence of cocaine. Now, we can't take it out, very minute quantity. So, do we, if we drink that water, do we become cocaine addict at the small? We really don't know. But I do, my personal gut reaction is probably not, but we really don't know. So, there's a lot of studies now going on to even to decide microplastics. We know there is microplastics, but how do we decide what level of microplastic is acceptable? It will be bad for health. We do not know the methodology to combine that. So, WHO, Singapore, few other countries are now looking into what to do with those types of new emerging contaminants that are coming, how to handle it. We do not want to add, um, as I said, Singapore is already measuring 340 water quality parameters, okay. We do not want to, unless there is a really harm and uh, problem, the cost of monitoring it, uh, looking at it will be immense, removing it will be immense. So, basically probably next 10 years we will not see very much, but we will be looking the methodological way to see what is the threshold level and methodologically it is very difficult to figure out what is the, uh, what is the level we should do. If you look at the lead level, even lead level, Europe and USA, two very advanced countries, they are not the same one is three times more than the other. So, does, does it mean one you, you, Europe is suffering from lead pollution? No, but 
those are some arbitrary economic thresholds we have decided. So there is a lot of research now going on on emerging contaminants from in most places. But the question is uh, we can't continue adding one after another. The cost of monitoring, cost of management goes up astronomically. Uh, we are not here, I, I don't know in India how much, how many pollutants you are monitoring. Most of them I don't think are monitoring more than 15 to 20 parameters. Not the big cities, but smaller cities probably are not doing more than 15 to 20. Singapore is already 340 regular can, and they are very conscious, more they go, more expensive they become, more complex it becomes. So unless we can prove that there is going to be some harm from this, from the emerging contaminants, and for that the government is spending a lot of money. One good thing is in Singapore, compared to anywhere, I worked 18 years in Oxford, all over the world, North America, it's the only country, only country where research fund is not a problem. In fact, the biggest problem, biggest problem in Singapore is the main KPI on research is have I spent the money that was given to me within the time, okay. It's not how much, if you save money, you are in trouble. You said if, if this year you are going to spend so much money, if I have got left 20 percent more in my research budget, I have to, believe me, I have to write 200 explanation why I overestimated or why I couldn't spend it. And it goes on my record that this fellow could not spend the money. We gave him the money. Biggest problem for us is to spend the money. And we always want to, any research project, we don't know what will happen. So I like to put a little extra. And most of the time that little extra remains extra. And then the question comes, how do I spend it before 31st of March? So what I do is 31st of March, just I ask my friend, hey, can you spend some money? <laughs> I have few thousand dollars left in my project. If you can use it by, by the end of January, I, we get a report every end of the, every month, how much have you spent. So by the end of January, if I see 20, 30,000 left over in my research budget and I can't spend it, I go to him and say, hey, if you can do it, I can pass it. That's not a problem. We will somehow we can justify it. Can you use twenty, thirty thousand dollars? If you can do, be my guest. Okay. So there are pluses and minuses in every system, and it's a good thing to be in positions like that, uh, rather than having no money. So, th but that is what we are seeing in, in Singapore. So, an emerging contaminants are <coughs> people measuring this field. Through groundwater, through ingestion of water, is in nanograms per liter. 
So the key challenge becomes is, you know, what is what is exposing in your body? How much is this nanogram per liter in groundwater that you're consuming playing a risk of uh, parts per million that you're getting exposed, you know, to other, you know, to other pathways? Like, you know, so it, that's where the debate is. You know, you know, we, we should we regulate? Because we are seeing in fish, you know, especially.